so as he introduced so i am a hardcore uh, critical care medicine uh, specialist practicing since almost 10 year uh, in uh, major quaternary referral center uh, in india today i am going to discuss the major part on covid 19 management in intensive care unit uh, what a respiratory therapist should be aware so this is the need of the hour so we are going to definitely have more and more burden in the coming days and we have to be uh, have a proper preparedness uh, for managing patient in critical care unit so here one thing you have to understand so it is saving the life of the patient along with we have to save ourselves also so it is very important each step whenever you are taking care of critically ill patient with covid 19 self care is very important self care is the dictum for any of the person who involved in the care of the patient particularly respiratory therapist so i'll just go through uh, initially a bit basics on uh, virus and its symptomatology so i'm going to uh, slowly narrow down to managing the patient uh, in intensive care unit so i am not going to discuss anything uh, which is pharmacology means like what currently uh, therapeutic option in terms of the drugs available uh, what are the clinical trials and what are currently available uh, bit experience or evidence on particular antivirals or uh, some anti malarials which uh, currently having lots of pros and cons so i am going to narrow down to the care of patient in relation to uh, respiratory therapist when it comes to a bit on the virus we know that covid 19 is also called as novel corona virus so before 2019 december before we get a epicenter viral pathology from wuhan china there was no much data on this so called covid 19 it is an rna virus so we also call it as sars cov 2 so it's a basically corona virus group that is a beta corona virus group so then we have to know a bit about the spread of this virus being an healthcare provider particularly when it comes to respiratory therapist who revolves around the respiratory system in terms of the care to critically ill patient you should be aware about a basic knowledge how the virus is going to spread so when it comes to spread we have in general three transmission routes that is one is droplet contact and airborne in general i am telling so when it comes to uh, contact we have in particular in our icu in indian scenario we have gram negative organisms like klebsiella so when we uh, discuss about the ventilator associated pneumonia so pseudomonas acinetobacter so all the gram negative bacteria will spread by contact so when it comes to covid 19 which can easily spread in the same way of contact transmission so droplet is something which is a bit bigger than that of the airborne particle so which is around 5 to 8 micron so it is going to like settle in a distance somewhere around 3 to 4 feet so when it comes to covid 19 some major way of spread is from the droplet and that of the contact so again when it comes to airborne lots of confusion initially so whether it will spread by airborne or not till now the conclusion is it can spread by airborne also because when the droplet get break down into smaller particle it can spread by airborne most common disease in indian scenario which spread by airborne is tuberculosis so whatever the care we are going to take for tb might require to covid 19 also so when it comes to spread it can spread from one person to other person droplet can settle down on the surface of a bed spread or maybe side rail of the bed or the cot door handle monitors laryngoscope blade laryngoscope handle so oxygen saturation probe or on the ventilator surface for 12 hours to 3 to 4 days depending upon the 
environmental temperature and that of the humidity and the surface on which it is going to settle so you have to be very careful so it is having a huge burden of spread by droplet and contact when it comes to infectivity so you should be aware because when a patient comes with some symptomatology you should be aware what is the range of infection so in terms of the duration it can be somewhere from 3 to 21 days from the beginning of their some sort of like prodromal illness so to the maximum 21 days the infectivity will be there so remember more sicker the patient more highest will be the infectivity so more sicker means those patients who are in icu definitely they are sicker more infectivity will be there so main incubation period is around 2 weeks but the mean incubation is around 6.4 days so the mean time of quarantine required uh, according to the data available which was around 6 days but it should be like stretch over a period of 2 weeks that's up to 14 days remember more dangerous are the patients are the person who are not going to mount any symptom suppose like an young maybe around 20 to 30 year so he might have a very mild symptom of some sort of sore throat or maybe just myalgia okay we might not bothered about his symptom so then he is going to take some bed rest but he is going to carry the virus and he is going to spread the virus like anything so basically asymptomatic patients are the more dangerous in terms of spreading the infection from one person to one person because even though he is asymptomatic he can spread the infection to more susceptible patients like immunocompromised elderly or maybe pediatric age group so they are the more dangerous so when it comes to symptomatology see being a respiratory therapist you should be aware so what symptoms the patient will come to particularly hospital and icu because see i initially told we are the person respiratory therapist is the one person who is going to deal in depth with the respiratory system so the symptoms also revolve majorly with a cough breathing difficulty and fever this is the data available till now from the wuhan italy and the spain but interestingly so it can present atypically also lots of data currently available so some patient they can manifest with the gut gastroenteritis with increased frequency of the stools that is the loose motion or in italy so recently we got the data young patient died because of covid 19 that is because of myocarditis they can have cardiac arrhythmias they can present with the chest pain palpitation so that may be the initial presentation they might not have any fever or cough or breathing difficulty so remember so these are some atypical manifestation when we go in depth analysis of the symptomatology these are the symptoms we are getting in relation to covid 19 so what is the prognosis so whether we need to worry about the infection per se see when it comes to severity so we calculated the severity percentage from the patients those who are reported to the healthcare unit suppose i told initially the patient is young so is asymptomatic is not going to reach the any medical attention at all so then we are not able to calculate that percentage so whether the prognosis is good or bad so overall available data suggest more than 80% of the patient they are not significantly ill and may not require hospitalization but when it comes to hospitalized patient near about 10 to 20% they require icu admission among them near about 2 to 10% they require endotracheal intubation and mechanical ventilation mortality so may spread from 1.5 to 2 to near about 5 to 8% if you see the mortality from italy and spain it reached up to 8 to 10% but when it compared to mortality in german which is about 0.75% so when it comes to death rate lots of confounding factors are going to be involved it may be comorbid condition of the patient immune status of the patient how severely the patient presented to the intensive care unit or their age as a major factor which is the determining when it comes to death rate so again should we have to be panic this is the initial data which comes from china wuhan 
so they included which is published in nejm so uh, in february uh, end so they included near about 1100 patient who are covid positive if you see near about 2.3% only they required endotracheal intubation and invasive mechanical ventilation overall mortality was 1.4% again whom to get worried definitely younger people so like the symptomatology is going to be mild or maybe moderate the mortality is also very minimal in in patient so they are not at risk the elderly who are more than 65 to 70 years or the more uh, are going to have the severity of the illness again so this is one slide which explains near about 42000 medical staff healthcare providers including the respiratory therapist nursing staff doctors involved in caring the patient in wuhan of this covid 19 initially but if you see their mortality it was 0% what it tells is if you have a adequate personal protective mechanism so personal protective equipment with taking consideration of proper preventive aspect of infection control policies you can avoid the mortality among healthcare provider it's very important so whenever you take care of the covid 19 remember recall practice personal protective equipment and personal safety as the first priority so again to remind you near about 80% of the patient might not have any severity of the illness they are going to get cured so don't be panic so it is the transmission speed is very rapid than that of the bad outcome with the covid 19 even though we have some bad experience from italy and the spain so but overall outcome is not so bad as compared to h1n1 pneumonia so again to understand what are the general risk factor so elderly which i already told so male sex available data suggest like male sex is having a more uh, additional risk factor those who are already having copd bronchial asthma so cardiac diseases like chronic hypertension coronary artery disease so those who are having previous stroke cerebral vascular uh, diseases diabetic those who are under having some steroid therapy or if they are having some immunocompromised status like retroviral disease or post chemotherapy post transplant patient these are the general risk factor to have a sickest manifestation because of this covid 19 so what general preventive measures so it applies to all the healthcare category that is particularly to respiratory therapist including the staff to the students okay you should be aware these at most general preventive measures the only way to prevent infection during the pandemic is to avoid the exposure to the virus okay so wash your hands with the soap and water alcohol based hand rubs okay avoid touching eyes nose mouth with the unwashed hands maintain at least a distance of 3 feet so that the droplets are going to settle within 3 to 4 feet so practice proper cough etiquette and respiratory hygiene so seek medical advice if you have fever breathing difficulty or cough these general preventive measures everyone should remember so again use mask appropriately this is the impact when the countries neglected using the mask in an appropriate way if you see the spike in us spain and italy it is exponential as compared to those countries where they used appropriate mask as a personal protective equipment again a bit on diagnostic test because see being a respiratory therapist you should be aware okay a patient came with some sort of mild symptoms okay so if they initially get some diagnostic if it is negative what it means okay so basic idea you should be aware so majorly we can diagnose covid 19 so on the basis of like some respiratory secretion something from the blood some imaging modality so when it comes to most commonly done diagnostic modality it is pcr technology so when you send the pcr test initially okay within 3 days there is a high possibility pcr may come as negative so initial negative test for covid 19 within 3 days doesn't mean they don't have the infection so at least you need 3 days 
for the PCR to get positive. That one point you have to remember. So when you are giving the care, so when you have a suspicion of COVID-19, suppose PCR came negative within three days, it doesn't exclude the infection. That is the take home message for all of you. Again, when to do the antibody test from the serum, so IgM, which is going to appear somewhere uh, on the end of one week and it stays in the body for about 21 days, IgG is going to appear after two weeks of the illness. So when it comes to imaging, so again, here you have to remember, imaging means either a chest X-ray or CT scan, take care of yourself with the appropriate infection control and preventive measures. So X-ray in about 75%, it's going to have the bilateral infiltrates, but in about 25% of the patient, it can have unilateral infiltrates in the chest X-ray. When to consider CT scan, okay? Do you require CT scan in all the patient? Answer is no. When the patient is having a suspected pneumonia, X-ray is not showing any patch or any infiltrates, patient is a bit deteriorating with the strong suspicion of the COVID-19, you can get CT scan. So CT, one important thing is, which gives some hint prior to the PCR test become positive. So it is very important, CT can guide, give some evidence before the PCR test is going to be positive. What are the findings in CT scan? Which can be multiple bilateral lobular subsegmental consolidation areas or most commonly ground glass opacities. So this is the most common finding in CT scan when it comes to COVID-19. So again, see in our unit also, we involve most of the respiratory therapist in taking the sampling also. So suppose it may be H1N1. So we used to take the help from the respiratory therapist to take the sampling for diagnostic modality. So being a respiratory therapist, you should be aware. So you should be properly prepared with the personal protective equipment with a face mask, eye protection, cap, double gloves, full apron, full body gown. So all these things are very important with the leg cover and all, very important before proceeding to take the sampling. So most commonly, we can take the respiratory sample either nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal, that is the throat swab. When it comes to nasopharyngeal, make sure your measured swab length may be somewhere from the external ear to that of the nostril. Just slowly go inside the nasopharyngeal cavity. You will get a bit resistance. Keep the swab for a minute there. After that, slowly roll it and remove without any spillage. It's very important. Don't make the spillage of any secretion. It can cause the droplet spread. So during the sample collection. Again, throat swab. So avoid the tongue or don't take the saliva. Touch the posterior pharyngeal wall or the tonsillar bed to take the sample with the utmost personal protective equipment usage. So again, the blood sample. So most of the time, nursing staff are going to draw the sample for serological test for antibody detection. But make sure if you are assisting in taking the sample, use appropriate so personal protective equipment. Again, is there any role for bronchoscopy when it comes to diagnosing COVID-19? Answer is no, because there is an enormous risk of transmission to care provider. It is an like manpower consuming procedure. Suppose for bronchoscopy, at least you need three members. Okay, you have to wear the personal protective equipment. When we have the scarcity of the supply of even face mask and the sanitizer, don't waste in using PPE equipment just to do the bronchoscope. Only bronchoscope is indicated. Suppose the patient is immunocompromised. So post patient is a post amyloid lymphoid malignancy or post transplant patient or retropositive patient. You want to check for some sort of pneumocystis pneumonia or like invasive fungal infection like invasive aspergillosis, then only bronchoscopy is indicated. But make sure you use appropriate personal protective equipment. Bottom line, so don't use bronchoscopy for diagnosing or to exclude the COVID-19. Again, which is the best test? I told initially, so currently PCR is the best test as compared to antibody testing. CT gives an idea 
regarding the covid 19 even though the findings are non specific but at least it tells some idea about the covid 19 before pcr is going to be positive if you club pcr with ct scan the sensitivity is near about 100% but the sensitivity with the pcr alone somewhere it's about 65 to 70% so that to after 3 days of the onset of illness antibody test which helps in after like maybe 2 to 3 weeks of the illness again antibody detection helps for some sort of calculating the prevalence in patient who don't have the symptoms but they are the carrier of the virus or if they manifest mild symptomatology to understand the herd immunity also we need to check the antibody level so when it comes to complications i told about the symptoms when it comes to complication pertaining to respiratory therapist so we are worried about the complications which are in and around the respiratory system so reported incidence of ards among the patient who are going to get admitted to icu somewhere between 20 to 30% so acute respiratory failure overall incidence is about 8% so other reason near about like 7 to 15% they can have cardiac arrhythmias so like secondary bacterial infection can happen in about 10% of the patient near about 4 to 8% of the patient can present with secondary infection with a septic shock with a hypotension hypoperfusion and all so majorly most manifestation as a complication being a respiratory therapist we worried about respiratory failure and ards so that is about 17 to 30 percent again there is a bit difference when it comes to pathophysiology of ards in patient with covid 19 so it is not like pulmonary cause for ards we know that ards causative can be divided into pulmonary and extra pulmonary that is also divided as so primary or secondary ards so when it comes to pathophysiology in relation to covid 19 ards can happen because of the virus directly which is going to affect the endothelial cells and pneumocytes of the alveolar capillary membrane which cause leaky capillary and can cause interstitial edema that is non cardiogenic so on the other hand it can lead to lots of cytokine release like we call it as cytokine storm interleukin 1 6 and tnf alpha which mobilizes the wbc particularly neutrophils into the lung which can again in turn like generate some more cytokines which leads to the damage to the barrier membrane and leads to leaky capillaries and interstitial edema so both direct and indirect mechanism are going to be involved in the pathophysiology of the ards when it comes to covid 19 so there are some data which suggest there is something called macrophage activation syndrome it is also called as hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis syndrome which present with lymphopenia means lymphocyte count will be low okay along with thrombocytopenia some ldh triglyceride ferritin c reactive protein is going to be elevated this is also one proposed mechanism of pathophysiology other so recently we got some manifestation in relation to heart that is the myocarditis cardiomyopathy arrhythmias and it can also have some gastro intestinal tract manifestation in terms of acute gastroenteritis this is the overall pathophysiology of the covid 19 so when it comes to ards i told initially slowly from the general aspect of the covid 19 what a respiratory therapist should know what a healthcare provider should know i will slowly move on to the like respiratory system narrow down to respiratory therapist approach so when it comes to ards this is the initial paper they try to assess the risk stratification among the patient it's a retrospective data they collected the data somewhere in between january and february near about 200 patient they included if you see elderly population neutrophilia organ dysfunction those who are already having coagulation abnormalities ards in its severity and increase in mortality again one more thing they found is see those who are going to have the manifestation of high grade fever they will have more and more chance of ards but even though they had high grade fever the overall outcome is good it means 
somewhere it suggests those who are having a immunological manifestation in the body their outcome is going to be better in terms of covid 19 but the problem with this study so it's a retrospective single center study so lots of selection bias they were not having appropriate preparedness when it comes to managing initial epidemic in the wuhan china when it comes to covid 19 lack of preparedness was also there but still there is an hint okay elderly immunocompromised organ dysfunction coagulopathy high grade fever so all these things are linked in and around to development of ards again what is the role of respiratory therapy or uh, respiratory therapist during this pandemic where we, they are all expected to work it may be in the ward area when we have not confirmed the covid 19 but we suspected the covid 19 based on their symptomatology that is fever cough and breathing difficulty are we already confirmed but they don't require icu therapy we clubbed in an isolated area that is called cohort isolation so we they are expected to work there also or in the emergency room in the triage areas recovery room when the patient got bit improved in hdo or step down icus mainly the role is in the intensive care unit when it comes to respiratory therapist so again move on so suppose okay you are the respiratory therapist available in the duty suppose you got some information okay patient with a suspected covid 19 with some respiratory symptoms is going to admitted to the icu what precaution you are supposed to take so try to get the initial assessment from a distance of not less than 6 feet okay don't jump on the patient if the patient is bit stable so try to evaluate the patient as the patient from about 6 feet so as long as like if you put the face mask on the symptomatic patient if the patient is coughing first thing you have to make is like make sure they should wear a simple at least a face mask then you start evaluating the patient so that you can avoid the burden of droplet spread suppose if no suspicion of the infection that is the covid 19 at least you have to follow regular universal standard precaution when you evaluate the patient if the patient came from the emergency room or the casualty with the nasal cannula with maybe 2 to 3 liter of oxygen on the nasal cannula put the face mask to them so at least it will avoid the burden of droplet spread of infection this is very important again suppose you need to transfer patient being a respiratory therapist you are going to involve in transporting the patient from one unit to other unit or maybe one building to other building within the same hospital campus first you get the information from the emergency medical service is there is any suspicion of the covid 19 okay or it's a proven case of covid 19 so again avoid like as much as possible relatives and other care givers in the particular vehicle where, where you are transporting the patient suppose how a driver can get protection if the separate cubic key is there for the driver so make sure all the windows and the doors which separate the driver cubic from that of the patient should be closed appropriately if some sometimes you might not have an adequate separate chamber for the driver in some vehicle then make sure the outside air vents in the near to driver are totally open and you switch on the exhaust ventilation in the patient area so to the maximum speed so then at least this will create some negative pressure so which helps in so preventing the aerosol spread of the covid 19 so open the air vents near to the driver and switch on the exhaust ventilation fan to the maximum speed in the patient area which creates some negativity so it's very important this precaution at least you can take it during transport of the patient so when it comes to like admitting the patient in intensive care unit you need to understand some logistic issues where to keep the patient keep the patient in negative pressure isolation suppose with the high burden you might not get negative pressure isolation you can cohort them in particular isolated area with all covid 19 together that is called the cohort isolation so convert maybe if you have a problem with getting the more and more icu bed your hdu 
so step down icu recovery room operation theater may need to get converted into intensive care unit beds at least maintain 6 feet distance in between the patients when it comes to manpower we know that the nursing we require one is to one allocation so at least i expect one respiratory therapist for four ventilated patient so it's very difficult to provide one is to one respiratory therapist at least two to three patient we can look after with uh, very bad criticality among the patient so the shift should not be like more than 6 to 8 hour shift because if you wear that personal protective equipment it is very difficult to stretch the duty hours more than 6 to 8 hours so your shift should end somewhere in between 6 to 8 hours proper preparedness drill on donning and duffing is very important remember so wearing a pp is very easy but when you remove after closely worked with the covid 19 positive patient that is the doffing of pp is very important because that is the time when you get most of the infection which are going to cause the self harm so you have to prepare practice proper drilling should be needed before you go for donning and doffing of this personal protective equipment so other rota so depends upon your institution so you should get a good moral support from your senior staff or your consultant in charge so that you are able to work with covid 19 positive in a risky area properly you need a support mentally physically okay so don't stretch after continuous 5 to 7 days of your duty after your seventh day at least you need some sort of quarantine for at least 10 to 14 days so it's very important so don't burden our the working hours also don't stretch more than a week when you are closely involved in managing the covid 19 patient again suppose like you are working in a ward area or the cohort area so this is something early warning score for n co patient that is the covid 19 patient these are proven patient you can use some criteria like 0 1 2 3 that is the risk stratification based on age respiratory rate oxygen saturation whether they require supplemental oxygen or not systolic blood pressure heart rate level of consciousness and the temperature it's very simple okay if you follow this chart so at least you are able to risk stratify when and which area you need to take the patient suppose you are working in the uh, ward where you have like proven patient in a covid area if the score is 0 one to 4 5 to 6 more than or equal to 7 more than or equal to 7 and which is moving to color code that is black from the red so according to that So you can change your monitor 12th hourly 6th hourly hourly or continuous and according to the severity you can consider where to keep the patient and when to approach critical care rapid response team that is the rrt team so this is a simple way so you can trouble identify and trouble shoot if you are working in cohort area because in my unit so respiratory therapist we have in icu we have in sleep lab we have in pulmonary function test area we have in ward area also so those who work in ward respiratory therapist they should be aware of this covid specific risk stratification charts again narrow down to airway control so coronavirus covid 19 airway control so it is very important so appropriate preparedness stock protection so all the movements should be attached with personal protective equipment hand hygiene full ppe minimize any method which generate the aerosol airborne infection isolate negative pressure isolation is mandatory so if you are able to get so prepare the drugs and equipment explain to the nursing staff also what you are expecting what equipment need to be ready formulate the plan early so assess the airway is the patient is having any obese neck or carmax grading is very bad so or malampetic grading is very bad so at least like like you have to evaluate the difficulty anything you are going to face in terms of intubation so connect the bacterial or viral filter to all the ventilator circuits particularly expiratory limb you keep everything ready so you have to be get ready video laryngoscope or the conventional laryngoscope with the blade and the lighting checked thoroughly again during the intubation it's very important to give weightage to team dynamics 
clear delineation of the roles is very important you tell okay person a you take care of the suction person b you take care of the medication person c you go to the head end you give the cricoid pressure you monitor you like manage the oxygenation of the patient you have to be properly allocate the role closed loop communication clear communication of airway plan you should be aware okay with your consultant whether you are going to put a 8 number tube 7.5 number tube okay what airway size you are going to use what laryngoscope you are going to use airway plan has to be adequately made so cross monitor each and every one for the good personal protective measures so when it comes to proper airway management so most experienced person is going to put the endotracheal tube so when you give the oxygen so don't keep like 10 liter 12 liter and all because more and more oxygen so it can develop the aerosol production so minimize the oxygen flow just to, to keep the saturation in an acceptable way use the tight mask don't create any leak so proper rapid sequence induction is very essential avoid bag mask ventilation as long as possible so inflate the cuff only you ventilate after inflating the pilot cuff otherwise patient is going to generate like aerosol which is going to be harmful after the intubation avoid unnecessary circuit disconnection okay suppose if at all you need to disconnect the circuit clamp the endotracheal tube so strict adherence to the proper doffing is very important when you remove your ppe make sure you follow all the steps because that is the time when you get when you can get self infected proper hand hygiene and again debrief what you have done what went wrong and what need to be prepared next time when you go for the airway control of the covid 19 patient so these are some additional protective mechanism okay so you can use some acrylic made glass chamber to avoid the droplet spread uh, for the self protection or you can put a, a transparent polythene so that you can prevent the spread of droplet these are some alternative methods uh, indians have developed and definitely they help in their own way when it comes to spread of infection during airway protection when it comes to ventilation properly so in a non sicker patient somewhere target oxygen saturation in under 92% if they have a hypoxic respiratory failure spo2 you need to target somewhere around 96% so in ards use low tidal volume ventilation that applies to other patients also covid 19 also may be somewhere around 4 to 8 ml per kg which weight that is the ideal body weight you need to calculate according to the sex of the patient and you have to ventilate according to ideal body weight not the actual body weight so use the peep according to artsnet peep fio2 table okay need not to adhere to the same values but you can take the guidance to alter the peep and fio2 keep the target of end inspiratory peep plateau less than 30 or driving pressure if you are able to understand that is the peep plateau minus peep keep it less than 15 so keep patient always adequately sedated use the muzzle relaxant if they are severely hypoxic maybe if the patient is having a pf ratio of less than 150 keep them paralyzed at least for initial 48 hours so when it comes to uh, fluid management so keep them bit dry because accumulated positive fluid balance is going to have an bad impact on the ards it is going to create more and more pulmonary congestion it may have problem with oxygenation of the patient so keep them a bit negative fluid balance so one practical aspect which tried in indian scenario so see the ventilator okay if you see uh, they have removed the ventilator where we get the graphics okay where we are going to manipulate peep tidal volume fio2 respiratory rate than that of the body of the ventilator this with the extension of the wire they kept outside the isolation room so it's a good idea the same thing we can do for the monitor also same thing we can do for the infusion pumps also so that we can avoid repeatedly going in close to the patient so that we can avoid the distance we can maintain the distance from the patient we can definitely avoid the Uh, spread of the infection to the healthcare providers particularly respiratory therapists because 
we are the one who are going to manipulate PPFIO2 and all. If you do something, some alternative like this, you can definitely avoid close contact with the patient very often. Again, should we consider proning for all the patients? So prior to proning, optimize the conventional ventilation, adjust the PEEP, FIO2, tidal volume. So give them a proper so-called lung protective ventilation. Still, if the patient is having a PF ratio less than 150, then you can consider going for prone ventilation. Again, remember, don't jump on prone ventilation for all the patients like other cause for ARDS because prone ventilation is very labor intensive, lots of exposure to the healthcare provider, particularly respiratory therapist, you can get self-infection during the proning procedure. But saying that, if they are still having a refractory hypoxemia, which is very profound, you can consider going for the prone. So this is the protocol which we used already. So you optimize the ventilation for 12 to 24 hours. If the PF ratio is still less than 150, then you can go for prone ventilation if it is more than 150, you can still go for conventional ventilation. Again, this is something interesting we got from the well-known Luciano Gettinoni. If you remember this name, Gettinoni is the one who done lots of things in ARDS management. Okay, lots of maneuvers, lots of papers published from this Gettinoni, including the Proseva trial that is on prone ventilation. So he given some thought process based on some experience uh, currently whatever they manage of the patient. So what is the conclusion on the ARDS presentation in COVID-19 is bit atypical as compared to the regular ARDS patient. Why it is atypical? There is a dissociation between so well-preserved lung mechanics and severely hypoxemia. One thing you have to remember, so these COVID-19 patients, they look normal, okay, but Suddenly, they deteriorate in terms of oxygen requirement. They become hypoxic suddenly. But when you see the lung mechanics, suppose if you see their compliance, compliance is very well preserved, but they are severely hypoxic. How we can explain? It can be explained only there is a loss of regulation of hypoxic vasoconstriction. So there is an altered perfusion of the lungs. What is going to happen? In ARDS, in COVID-19 patient, there is an increase in shunt fraction. It means so the patients are going to get like blood supply more and more into the lung, which doesn't have any proper ventilation. It means hyperperfusion of gasless tissue, which leads to increased shunt fraction. This is the main problem, which is not like manifesting regular our ARDS patient as compared to this COVID-19. So what is the impact? Suppose if you do non-invasive ventilation or CPAP to an ARDS with COVID-19, so they generate more and more negative inspiratory pressure, which leads to increase in transpulmonary pressure. That is the P plateau can jump more than 30, so which leads to self-inflicted lung injury. That may be in terms of ventilator-induced lung injury, that is particularly volume trauma. Means, so spontaneous breathing with NIV, with CPAP, it is going to create a very bad because we don't have any control over the tidal volume. Tidal volume is the one which helps in preventing the mortality, that is the low tidal volume, preventing the volume trauma. When any intervention which doesn't have any control on the tidal volume, we can't give any light, low tidal volume with the NIV. Okay, it depends solely on the patient's inspiratory effort, which can create more and more lung injury. Second point, suppose if you give more and more high PEEP, but the lung is very good compliant, okay? There is no question of recruitable lung in COVID-19 patient, but if you give more and more high PEEP, PEEP, if you increase, it will increase the intrathoracic pressure more and more positive, decreased right-sided venous retin, decreased cardiac output, hypotension, unstable hemodynamics, the same time, which can have some impact on the renin angiotensin mechanism, leads to fluid retention. So, don't unnecessarily keep on giving the PEEP in COVID-19 ARDS because their lung is very well compliant. You can manage them with a minimal PEEP in terms of your achieving oxygenation goal. So, next is proning. I told, so even though someone who is refractory hypoxic, you can consider proning. But COVID-19 ARDS is going to have a very good compliance, okay? 
don't create proning in all the patient with a covid-19 ards because it is going to have a lots of man power consumption in the same time so it is going to have a problem with the droplet spread to the caregiver and it may not be required because their compliance is very good bottom line after considering that so they recommend ventilate the patient with covid-19 so to buy extra time with a minimum additional damage the lowest possible peep and gentle ventilation may not require jumping on the prone ventilation and high peep for covid-19 this you have to remember because the presentation of ards in covid-19 is bit atypical as compared to regular ards patient so should we go for recruitment for all the patient if you see both the x rays which patient is going to get benefit so if the distribution is more diffuse of the infiltrates moderate to severe ards means the pf ratio is somewhere less than 170 180 so without any cardiogenic pulmonary edema extra pulmonary cause they will get some benefit from the recruitment again so something which looks recruitable may not be recruitable at all so don't jump on going for the recruitment maneuver for all the covid-19 patients also again what add on therapy the question is should we give the steroid in ards patient with covid-19 or not all the patients okay so if they are just ventilated with some sort of respiratory failure doesn't have severe ards don't give the corticosteroid if they have mechanical ventilation with the respiratory failure and if they are having severe ards then you can give systemic corticosteroid but still currently we don't have major data we need more and more data but we have to wait for some convincing evidence till that we just individualize the steroid therapy again what to use for like fever you can simply give paracetamol as compared to other nsaids for controlling the temperature so when it comes to extubation make sure at least two person should be present full personal protective equipment is very essential so don't encourage them too much coughing if at all you want to check their coughing so just to check before disconnecting the circuit be prepared for the intubation this is again something you can do during the extubation also cover them adequately with the transparent polythene so that you can avoid the droplet spread again a bit on high flow nasal cannula so this is some interesting study they have done Uh, in singapore what they have done healthy volunteers they have taken five member they were uh, just checking the coughing distance because of the high flow nasal cannula so what they have done so they put the high flow nasal cannula and without high flow nasal cannula to understand the distance of coughing and the distance of uh, cough effort so there was a about half meter difference between when you put the patient on high flow nasal cannula the cough distance can be increased to Half a meter. So that's why. Suppose if you want to use HFNC in COVID-19 patient, make sure you use proper personal protective equipment and use the HFNC in negative pressure airborne isolation room. Again, if you increase the flow to more than 60 liter per minute, there is a chance you can convert. the droplet into aerosol infection so make sure maybe you can keep the flow somewhere around 25 to 30 or maybe 30 35 kind of this one and manage the patient with hfnc with proper personal protective equipment in a negative pressure isolation room not in a regular icu so again some practical points to remember so whenever you are using niv avoid using niv first of all but if you are using optimal fit is very essential to prevent the dispersion of exhaled air discourage the use of high flow nasal cannula when you don't get any airborne isolation like negative pressure isolation room and all intubation should be done by an expert backup airway plan should be always ready avoid bag mask ventilation pre oxygenate with non aerosol generating means again if manual bagging is required you can use sub supraglottic airway devices like laryngeal mask airway and all but we need more and more experience on that because at least if you use lma it will give a good seal so that it will prevent the droplet spread use waveform capnography to confirm endotracheal placement than auscultating them because if you go more proximity to the patient there is a high chance of droplet infection to care provider particularly respiratory therapist 
rapid sequence induction is mandatory in emergency intubation prefer rocuronium when you give the muscle relaxant because it's having a prolonged half life and it also having some capacity to suppress the cuffing and omitting so that you can prevent uh, droplet generation cuff should be inflated immediately to avoid the leakage once you like inflate the cuff then only you ventilate the patient before inflating the cuff don't ventilate because again it leads to aerosol generation and spread of infection to the care provider some more practical uh, pictorial uh, representation so this is how you can put like face mask on the nasal cannula or high flow nasal cannula so don't use venturi mask don't use face tint or track collar because there is a high chance of conversion of droplet to aerosol spread again when the patient is on tracheostomy ensure you use a closed suction catheter modality not the open suction switch to hme with oxy vent adapter for uh, like tracheostomy uh, connectors don't use any sort of nebulizer or aerosol treatments which are not recommended you can use metered dose in an mdis or preferred as compared to regular nebulizer to prevent the aerosol development so bronchial hygiene don't encourage them to too much cough because in regular patient you can give a proper physio make them cough generate the secretion and all but be careful in covid 19 don't go for very thorough in depth bronchial hygiene or cough producing maneuver so whenever you are using bag wall ventilation use like filter in the expiratory wall it may apply when the patient is having tracheostomy or when you are using orofacial mask also again when you do the suction keep an option on the ventilator like click on the suction support so that when you disconnect the ventilator for open suction first of all don't use the open suction so it will avoid giving the breath so that it will not create any aerosol production so use the appropriate filter for both inspiratory and expiratory circuit whenever you are changing the circuit so take away all the assembly including the filter these are some practical uh, points which are very essential at the bedside for all the respiratory therapists to remember to avoid the spread of infection so again last bit of slides so should we get a prophylaxis for a respiratory therapist again our icmr recommends asymptomatic healthcare workers involved in the care of suspected or confirmed cases of covid-19 or asymptomatic household contact of confirmed cases they should get prophylaxis but here see it is not like strong recommendation everyone should jump on getting the prophylaxis with hydroxychloroquine because when you consider chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine you to weigh the risk and benefit because so hydroxychloroquine or the chloroquine they can cause very bad arrhythmias life threatening arrhythmias in terms of qt prolongation in the ecg they can cause very bad nausea and vomiting they can cause so maculopathy or retinopathy you have to be very careful so it is individualized selection when it comes to prophylaxis not generalized for all the uh, caregivers particularly when it comes to respiratory therapist to conclude so respiratory therapist play a major role in caring of the patient with a covid 19 positive particularly in critically ill area in the era of this pandemic so preventive measures are very 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 important so like personal protective equipment quarantine isolation principle hand sanitization only about 30% require hospitalization and 4% require icu care don't think we have a huge burden for the icu of the patient but they are like potentially risky patient most of the icu management of erds is like that of the general management but remember erds manifestation is bit atypical in covid 19 don't give too much peep don't jump on going for the lung means uh, prone ventilation follow the lung protective ventilation with a low tidal volume conservative fluid management so proning assess the risk and benefit steroid in severe patients individualize the therapy so when you consider using niv and hfnc be prudent understand the limitations of hfnc and niv switch over as early as possible to invasive ventilation whenever possible in any particular patient strict infection prevention policies are very important 
prioritize the therapy with limited resources see we are not managing the limited number of patients we are into the pandemic okay suppose a patient a who is having multiple comorbidities 80 years age severely hypoxic on maximum ventilatory support like is requiring 80% fio2 12 14 of peep his compliance is very bad his peep plateau is more than 30 32 or his diving pressure is 16 18 and all okay we can't help okay we can't help so you have to prioritize the therapy okay you have to understand where to put the full stop in the limited resources during the pandemic with this i'll conclude my session so thank you all for listening uh if you have any questions i am happy to answer so you can open.